Welcome to this episode of the Catechetical Corner, handing on and defending the faith. In St. Paul's letter to the Romans, he writes the following about the pagan world in which his Christian audience finds themselves. For when the Gentiles, who do not have the law by nature, observe the prescriptions of the law, they are a law for themselves, even though they do not have the law. This law that St. Paul speaks about is written on the heart of every human person and can be known fully through the use of human reason, absent of any revelation by God. The natural law is rooted in objective reality and is what philosophers refer to as objective truth. This has become the question of our age. Do you believe in objective truth? The world responds today much as Pontius Pilate did in the first century when truth itself was staring him in the face with an obstinate and self-serving relativistic response. What is truth? Modernity asserts that we are not destined to discover reality, but to create it. This philosophical idea has severe consequences, and they've come to fruition in half a century after a former pope prophesied they would in his encyclical Humani Vitae. In this episode, Bishop Douglas Desitel will conclude his reflections on the impacts of the sexual revolution inside and outside the modern culture and the Catholic Church. Um, I've been asked to um, address uh, some important things and one important area of catechetics, uh, and that is to make sure that we are very clear on the many challenges that we face in our society today, especially dealing with um, life issues, uh, with the church's pro-life teaching, the many challenges to that in our society today. And I thought I would go through uh, a number of them and then present uh, the church's a teaching on many of these uh, important issues that we face every day and which we as catechists, as teachers, me as shepherd of the diocese, uh, have to answer uh, day in and day out against some very uh, loud uh, and convincing uh, teachings that are contrary to what we believe in the church. Uh, and all of these centered in, I think, on one central problem, one central factor that makes so many of these possible. And that is the absence of God and the consideration of what God's intention is for the human person, uh, for marriage, and for human sexuality. First of all, who said and why can the church, why does the church have the authority to teach uh, in moral matters and also to bind in conscience huh, uh, Christians. First of all, the authority of the church rests on the authority of Jesus Christ. Huh? Jesus Christ is the word of the Father, the ultimate uh, revelation uh, of God the Father in heaven. Uh, and the words of Jesus are the words of God the Father. Uh, we read in the Gospels, Jesus saying, the Father and I are one. And then again, when St. Philip asked Jesus, just show us who the Father is, Jesus told him, Philip, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. If we want to know who the Father is, we look to the person of Jesus Christ. Uh, again, Jesus' words, he who hears my word and keeps them is like the wise merchant who went and sold everything that he had to buy that one precious pearl. Again, Jesus uh, speaks of his authority when he says, the one whom God sent speaks the word of God. And that's, he was talking about himself. And so this same authority was passed on by Jesus to St. Peter and the other apostles. Uh, Jesus told Peter, I give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven Whatever you declare binding on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. The authority that Jesus gave 
to Peter and his successors. And to the other apostles, Jesus speaks, whoever hears you, hears me. Whoever rejects you, rejects me. And then again, the final mission that Jesus gave to his apostles, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. Proclaim the gospel to the whole world. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Whoever does not believe will be condemned. And then again, the night of the resurrection, Jesus telling the apostles, whose sins you forgive are forgiven, whose sins you retain are retained. At the Last Supper, Jesus promised the gift of the Holy Spirit to guide the apostles in the truth and to strengthen them to teach. The mission of teaching all nations is passed on to the successors of St. Peter and the other apostles, the Pope and bishops of the church. And so the authority that the church has or the business that the church has to teach in moral matters uh, is derived from the authority of Jesus Christ himself. In a very important document that is listed on your uh, agenda today, Humani Vitae, 1968, Pope Paul VI wrote the following, Jesus Christ, when he communicated his divine power to Peter and the other apostles and sent them to teach all nations his commandments, constituted them authentic guardians and interpreters of the whole moral law. Not only that is of the law of the gospel, but also the natural law. The reason being that the natural law tells us about the will of God and its faithful observance is necessary for men's eternal salvation. We find two sources of the moral law. First, divine revelation, huh? that is the gospel, the scriptures tell us about Jesus' teaching on the moral law. The second is the natural law, the law that we call that is written in the hearts of men, according to St. Paul, who wrote to the Romans, the demands of the law are written in their hearts. And there are certain things that we know, even if we never heard the gospel, even if we never met Jesus Christ, even if we never made a novena, even if we never turned in our envelopes for the bishop's appeal, we know we know that to unjustly take someone's life is wrong. We feel bad. Why do we feel bad? Because it's the natural law. It's written in our hearts. We know in our hearts to uh, take someone's property against their desire for you to have it is wrong. It's what St. John Newman said is the voice of conscience. It's that little voice that's in us that makes us, now, if we ignore it enough times, well, it won't do its work anymore, huh? But if we, we know when we're taking something, stealing from someone who doesn't want us to have it, we feel bad about it, you know? We, well, that's the natural law telling us the, the will of God, huh? The will of God. Or telling a lie, you know? We tell a lie. Uh, if we tell a lie, and um, even though we don't, didn't go to catechism, didn't go to church, didn't do anything, uh, we know deep down somehow that not telling the truth when someone has a right to know the truth uh, is wrong. Uh, we feel that. Now you can lie enough times where it doesn't bother you anymore. Well, let's call a dead conscience, you know. It doesn't, it doesn't bother you anymore. Uh, but that's like not exercising and using a muscle, okay? If you quit using your muscle, you get flabby. Huh? Well, the same thing with our conscience. It gets flabby if we don't use it enough. Another challenge to uh, Catholic teachings is the subject of direct sterilization, which is a medical procedure uh, for a woman or a man to prevent uh, conception of a child, to prevent conception. Uh, it can be the tubal ligation for the woman or uh, the vasectomy for uh, the man. And some of the same excuses are given for that also. It's my body, I can do with it what I want. Uh, I don't uh, want any more children. I don't have enough, I, don't, I have too, much too many children already. 
Uh, I have a right to sexual expression, but I don't want children as a result of that. Uh, or sometimes it's used medically to prevent some future medical condition. We'll talk about that a little bit later on. On the question of sterilization, uh, direct sterilization is in essence mutilation, like a tubal ligation or vasectomy for non-pathological reasons. It is a way of frustrating the natural process designed by God and the connection for the generation of human life. Now it's important to get the word direct sterilization huh? because sometimes if there is a diseased organ or if there is a tumor uh, or some other pathology which a surgeon goes in to remove huh, without the direct intention huh, of causing sterilization, that's not, uh, that's not immoral to do that, okay? They're going, you're going in to resolve a pathological condition uh, not to prevent uh, conception, okay? Sometimes it's a byproduct. Uh, of a surgery uh, procedure uh, that has this side effect uh, of rending a person unable to conceive. Another challenge to Catholic teaching uh, has to do with the sacrament of marriage and that is of course uh, something that is at the forefront many times and that's same-sex marriage and the excuses that are given for uh, two people of the same sex uh, getting, wanting to or getting married in many states in our country. Uh, and the excuses that are given for that many times, I am physically attracted to others of the same sex. I should be able to love whomever I want to. That's my freedom to do what I want. Uh, many times the excuse is given that traditional uh, definitions of marriage and the family are old-fashioned or it's passé. Uh, who made up those rules anyway? Uh, also that it's legal. Uh, in, as I said, in many states in our country and it's legal in many countries in the world. On the question of same-sex marriage, uh, the answer of the church has always been huh, that marriage is not simply a contract or an agreement that two people come together and say, hey, let's do this, okay? It's not only that. Uh, and also that marriage isn't something that, as some propose, it's not something that simply evolved over history, where people suddenly decided, hey, this would be a convenient way to live, you know, we can share expenses and we can uh, do what we want and so forth. Uh, but no, marriage is instituted by God by his design, male and female complement each other and become one. And from this complementarity of, of man and wife, in union with God's design, new life is born. It's out of this union. It was raised to the, it always existed, it was raised to the level of a sacrament, filling with grace and supporting husband and wife who become in the sacrament of matrimony, a sign of Christ's love and oneness with us, the church. Persons, and some do, have same-sex attraction, may indeed love one another, but can never be defined as marriage. The subject which is the most obvious, contrary to human life, and that is of abortion, which is the direct termination of a fertilized human egg or embryo. And many excuses are given for abortion in, our, in society as a whole worldwide. Uh, the excuse that, well, this is a, an inconvenient pregnancy, uh, or that uh, I have some financial considerations. Uh, either I, don't, I can't afford to have a baby at this time, I, um, want, I have some plans uh, for uh, my future that, uh, that will require a great deal of financing and I can't afford the expense of having another child in my family. All of these are excuses that we hear, uh, that I hear, uh, for abortion. Uh, another one is that uh, somehow it's not a human being 
until it's born, so it's not really the taking of innocent human life. Uh, other ones that we hear and that touch directly on this subject of eliminating what God's intention is, is the excuse, well, it's my body and I can do with it what I want. Uh, no one's going to tell me what to do with, with my body. Um, another is that is uh, sadly becoming, another excuse that's becoming sadly more and more used uh, is that because there is some medical or physical imperfection uh, with the embryo or with the unborn child, that is a reason for ending it, for a direct ending of its life. Uh, the most obvious excuse many times given is that it's legal. Uh, as it is in most states in our union, in most countries, save a few, uh, it is uh, sanctioned by law. First of all, abortion is the unjust taking of innocent human life. There's no doubt of anyone. Science has proved that a fertilized human egg has all the elements of a human being. It's not going to be a dog. It's not going to turn out to be your parrot or your kitty cat. It's going to be a human being every time. It's all written in the DNA of the fertilized human embryo. And it is why, as the popes have taught uh, through the ages, that the destruction of a fetus at any stage is always a grave moral evil because life begins at conception. Uh, the human body, whether in the womb or later as an adult, is not its own boss, is not autonomous as the secular world believes today. The human body is God's with a, des a definite design and purpose. Another disturbing um, challenge huh, to our understanding of the human person that we read more and more about and which we uh, in schools uh, will have to deal with more and more in the future is the question of sex transitioning. Sex transitioning where someone who is born biologically a male or a female uh, wants to um, change that and wants to become the opposite of what they were biologically born. Uh, excuses for that often are given that I have a right to be who I want to be. I decide who I want to be. Uh, and so that's again goes back to that thing of the not asking the question, what does God want us to be or who, how did God create us? Um, a person who is physically a boy or girl but wants to be a girl or a boy. That's often the excuse that is given. Again, it's my body and I can do what I want with it. I'm the boss of that. Um, I want to play a certain sport, so I have to transition so that I can play football or so that I can be a ballerina, I guess, or something just, just to fit that. Um, also, many have uh, this, and it's very legitimate, outside um, I'm physically a boy, but inside I feel like a girl, or mentally I feel like a girl, and that's very real, you know, and that those are many of the excuses that are given for sex transitioning. And the church's answer is that we are biologically who God created us to be at the time of our birth. Uh, psychologically, there are people who have a dysphoria or who have psychological problems huh, with their, the identity of their biological sex. And those we have to treat, of course, with compassion and help them as much as we, as we possibly can. Huh? Uh, but it, it, it's, um, you know, it, it, it's not a, a reason for uh, transitioning uh, something different than what we uh, are born biologically. At the end of the day, no matter what the label is, words like gay and lesbian and bisexual, at the end of the day, it's still a label. At the end of the day, it doesn't sum up who you are. You're a person. You are a unique, unrepeatable person. And you're complicated. And that's just who we are. We're, we're complicated people.
I was always really into imaginative play. My parents really encouraged that. I mean, we definitely had toys, but if it was the summer, it was like, you're not coming inside until dinner. You know, we were outside. Uh, we were running around in the woods. We would pretend that it was a magical world. My parents raised us Catholic. Uh, we were at Mass every Sunday, prayed before all of our meals. Uh, we went to Catholic school all the way through. Yeah, in middle school, of a class of 30 or 40, like a quarter of you are popular just by default. Um, you know, whereas you get into high school and things get a lot more complicated socially. And I just found I just had a tough time adjusting. Um, in the summer between my freshman and sophomore year, I go to this conference and, you know, there's over 2,000 teens that are there. You know, the energy was high and that night, you know, there we were. The room is dark. There's just the light of these candles, you know, up on the altar. I'm just kneeling there. I can still remember because we were in this huge gymnasium, right? And our group had gotten stuck all the way in this back corner but I just could not take my eyes off the monstrance. And I felt like in this room of thousands of people, he was looking at me. Um, I just felt like he saw those places I was alone and angry. He saw those places where I was despairing. And he didn't just see it, he didn't just pass by, right? But he knew it, right? He was entering into my heart. Um, and he loved me. <laughs> he loved me in that place. That was the point where I really made a choice. This is something I want to do. I want to find out what that gift is. I want to find out who this God is. Um, and then when I did, you know, kind of make a group of friends, one of the friends started kind of slipping away. And I realized when I thought about this friend that I kind of thought about her in a romantic way. I found myself in a series of codependent friendships. There was one in particular um, where that was a little bit mutual. And it kind of got to the point where we're like, what's going on here? Uh, and we named to each other, like we're attracted to each other. And eventually that friendship just kind of imploded. And what was going on in my heart was, I feel like I just broke up with someone. Like, I, I feel like we broke up and I was jealous of some of her other friends. And I just kind of had to admit to myself, like, I think I was in love with her. And I realized, like, I can't do this by myself. So I started uh, talking to other friends, uh, spiritual direction, like kind of talked through that friendship and counseling a little bit and started being more honest with God as well. And really starting to name this with God and be like, okay, this is what's happening. And I don't need to hide this in like the darkness of my heart, um, but I can bring it out into the light before God. I can bring it out into the light before these friends that I trust. Um, and God can move in that space. <laughs> I graduated with theology and catechetics majors. So I was really immersed in a really solid theology just learning a lot about the faith and I just could not get enough. I studied abroad, I went on a ton of road trips, had opportunities of service. Yeah, it's, it's every day, ultimately, like the choice to follow Christ. And if we really believe that heaven is real, if we really believe that God has made us for an infinite love, then the journey is a joy. Because we're moving, we're moving in the direction of the fulfillment of our desires. We're moving in the direction of the ultimate joy, the ultimate destination. It's not that I don't experience attraction. It's not that at moments, you know, you don't like imagine what this could be like with this person. But at the deepest level, what I want is Christ, right? What I want is to be united with the true lover of my soul. And he had things to say. When he's questioned about the nature of marriage and divorce, what does he do? He points back to Genesis. He points back to the Garden of Eden in the beginning, right? When man and woman were made intentionally designed to fit. 
and that that union will be life-giving, right? That's what Jesus points to, and I, and I believe him. And I understand how it fits in the big picture of things. I understand why the uniqueness of masculinity matters, why the uniqueness of femininity matters. If I were ever to choose against it, I would be denying myself. We have a, a common origin, we have a common destiny, and we have a common hot mass in the middle. Uh, we all come from God, right? We're all created in His image and likeness. We all have intrinsic dignity. I think a lot of times we forget the power of human autonomy, uh, the ability to choose Christ, to choose fellowship, to choose vulnerability, to choose prayer. The choice to follow Christ, to live in his grace, the choice to trust in his mercy is, is a daily thing. And, and the beauty of an infinite God <laughs> um, is we've got an infinite way to go. There is not a more complete revelation of the totality of the human person than the doctrine found in the Catholic Church. Pope St. John Paul II left the church an amazing and prophetic gift in the theology of the body. That is the answer to what it really means to be human. The world is in desperate need for an accurate and meaningful explanation of our humanity. Every dogmatic and moral teaching that was revealed by Jesus Christ and entrusted to his church to be preserved and passed on is organically connected to that fundamental question. As you just heard from Ann Carter, one of the founders of Eden Invitation. You're not a problem or a project. You're a unique body-soul composite that can't be repeated and is destined for union and God for all eternity. Humanity is more than its sexual orientation, and it does not define who you are. Regardless of what popular public opinions that often change as quickly as the direction of the wind have placed on behaviors and not persons. The natural law is written on the heart of every person, and its reality will pursue you relentlessly through the incarnation in the person of Jesus Christ. Thanks for tuning into this episode of the Catechetical Corner, and join us next time as I share this incredible teaching of Pope St. John Paul II, witness to couples who are preparing for the sacrament of holy matrimony. God love you, and we'll see you next time.